Hi class, today I'm going to talk um, a little bit about the final review. I'm not necessarily going to solve every problem in here for you because um, these are basically what we have been learning to do throughout this entire class. So if I don't solve it, we'll talk about how to think about it. So here we have a problem that involves support force. Um, so I want you to think about an empty jug that uh, weighs two newtons at rest. You know to pick out that phrase now. At rest on a flat table. How many newtons of support force does the table provide? Uh, what is the net force on the book? It should say jug. What is the net force on the jug in this case? Uh, what is the support force when water of weight 0.6 newtons is poured into the jug? Draw a free body diagram in each case. So that's how you should be thinking about this. All right, you can now see a table and a jug have appeared. So draw a free body diagram. It says that the empty jug weighs two newtons. We know weight is talking about the force of gravity. It's already in newtons, so we don't have to multiply by that constant acceleration due to gravity. That's been done. So there's two newtons down. It says it's at rest. So what is the support force? The support force has to be in the other direction, and it must be two newtons. What is the net force? The net force is going to be two newtons minus two newtons. So the net force is zero. All right, and I've written that out for you here. The net force is the vector sum of the forces, two newtons, minus two newtons, and that is equal to zero newtons. We know the net force is zero because it's at rest. It's not going anywhere. The net force must be equal to zero. Um, so we answered those two. Just pretend that says jug. What is the support force when water of weight 0.6 newtons is poured into the jug? Well, 0.6 newtons of weight has been added to what is the downward force here. So 0.6 newtons of weight must be added to the upward force. So it's going to be 2.6 newtons. Draw a free body diagram in each case. We draw, drew a free body diagram for, for the first case there. And you could draw another one for when the 0.6 um, newtons of water is added. All right, uh, for this one, just like the lab, a 1,000 newton crate is resting on a surface. It is connected to a 500 newton block through a frictionless pulley as shown. Friction between the crate and the surface is enough to keep the system at rest. So we have a very important piece of information right there. That tells me that the vector sum of these forces is going to equal, I hope you have filled in and said zero, zero newtons. Um, the arrows are showing the forces that are acting on the crate and the block. This is the crate on the table. This is the block hanging here. Fill in the magnitude of each force. I read the problem. It tells me that this crate is 1,000 newtons. So I know this arrow is representing the weight of the crate. It's 1,000 newtons. So 1,000 is going to go right there. So hopefully I can do that one with three zeros. Not quite. But there you go. So there's no movement in this direction, the up-down direction. So if there's 1,000 newtons down, the normal force, that's what that little N stands for, or the support force, same thing, must be the same magnitude. We can see that it's in the exact opposite direction. So 1,000 newtons up. Um, this, we are told, is 500 newtons. It's not going anywhere, so I know the downward force on this is 500 newtons. There's no little blank for me to label that, but I know that that's 500 newtons. Therefore, the tension in the string, which is directed this way, exact opposite, must also be 500 newtons. This pulley that you can see here is existing Merely to change the direction of the force, it was up down, I'm changing it to horizontal. So it's again the tension in the string. There's 500 newtons of tension force here. How many newtons of tension force are you going to fill in there? 500 newtons. So 
So this crate is not still, just because the weight of this crate is 1,000 newtons, it's still, and this is only 500 newtons, because there is another force, we can see that 500 newtons is pulling it this way, and what we've been calling the positive x direction, right? So I know that there has to be an equal force acting in the other direction. It's that force of static friction, and it's 500 newtons. All right. If the crate and the block in this figure are moving at constant speed instead of at rest, they are moving at constant speed, no acceleration. What is the tension in the rope? Still 500 newtons. However, in this case, it is not static equilibrium. It's dynamic equilibrium. All right. Here we have a 18-ton truck and 18-ton truck. And it's on this bridge. The bridge weighs 45 tons. So the truck is on the bridge. The bridge weighs 45 tons. A 36-ton support force is operating on the left side of the bridge. I want to know how much support force is operating on the right side of the bridge. There's no acceleration here is the key component. It says that that 18-ton that truck is one quarter of the way across the bridge. It doesn't matter. It could be halfway across the bridge three quarters of the way across the bridge. It's just sitting there on the bridge. So that's where its weight is operating from, okay? So I have 18 tons um, on this whole system acting downward because of the truck. I have 45 tons acting downward because of the weight of the bridge itself. I know I have these 36 tons upward. I'm looking for these. So again, we know that the vector sum of the forces is equal to zero. All right, so when I set up my vector sum equation, I have the vector sum of the forces is equal to this 36. I've made it positive. I've just defined the upward direction as positive. You can go the other way. It doesn't matter. Just be consistent. So I have 36 times plus the force of support right minus 18 times minus 45 times is equal to zero. When I use my algebra, solve for force of support right, I get 27 tons. All right, here we are talking about acceleration. Change in velocity is acceleration. So we know, and you will have your formula sheets, that acceleration is equal to delta V, delta meaning change in, so change in velocity over change in time. Uh, we are told that, uh, uh, here, we're, oh, a gazelle. A gazelle can reach a velocity of 13 meters per second in the course of three seconds. So I started at rest, zero meters per second. I got up to 13 meters per second. So my change in velocity, 13 minus zero, over my change in time, change in time would be three seconds here, is going to equal 4.33 meters per second every second. Gazelle is pretty fast. The lion is going to reach a speed of 9.5 meters per second, and it's going to take him two seconds. So the lion starts from rest, gets up to 9.5 meters per second, all in the course of two seconds. When I solve this, I do 9.5 minus zero, I get 9.5 minus, not minus, I'm just divided by, divided by two, so 9.5 divided by two. And I get 4.75 meters per second every second. So that's my acceleration for the lion. Then I look at our friend, the lowly trout, and I am told that a trout can get up to 2.8 meters per second, but it only takes him 0.12 seconds to do that. So he's starting from rest, so I do 2.8 minus 0, divide that by 0.12, and I get 23.33 meters per second every second of acceleration. So the trout is the winner. All right, here I want to calculate the vertical height attained by a basketball player who achieves a hang time of 0.8 seconds. I know that time up is equal to time down, and that hang time is equal to the time I spend going up as well as the time I spend coming down, my entire time in the air. So because it, the whole thing is um, 0.8 seconds, I know that I spent 0.4 seconds going up. So then I come to my formula, distance is equal to 1 half gt squared. I know the value for t now is this 0 
I know the value of G, I'm just going to use 10, not 9.8. The value of G is 10 meters per second squared, 10 meters per second every second. When I square time, those units of seconds square, so I get seconds squared over here, seconds squared over here. Those seconds squared will cancel out because with G they're on the bottom. So I have five, um, and my only unit left is meters. So one half of G is five times T squared, I will get 0.8, and my unit is going to be meters. So this person has jumped 80 centimeters into the air, or 0.8 meters. All right, here, if we are looking for the average speed someone went, um, you know that that's the speed averaged out, not your instantaneous speed. So let's picture a car. It's driving along a certain road at the speed of 40 kilometers per hour. It returns along the same road with speed of 60 kilometers per hour. What is its average speed for the whole trip? Don't just look at the two speeds and average them. We're going to get a little more sciency. We know that distance is equal to velocity times time, so let's solve for the time there. We're just going to say the road is um, 120 that should say kilometers, not meters. Just say the road is 120 kilometers. So I drove 120 kilometers at 40 kilometers per hour. It took me three hours to get there. I drove the same 120 kilometers on the way back, but I was being a little speedier. This time I went at 60 kilometers per hour, so it took me two hours to get back. The total time I spent driving then is three hours there, two hours back, five hours. So the total distance I went was 120 kilometers there, 120 kilometers back. So 240 kilometers, 120 plus 120, divided by my total five hours of driving time. So I can see that my average speed for this trip then is 48 kilometers per hour. All right, here we're going to look at our skater friend, an experienced skater to be doing this. Um, I'm, she's using a rocket propulsion to power her skating, and the total mass of the student and all her equipment is 200 kilograms. Um, so for my first table, we're making it pretty easy. I'm telling you the net force on her, the force of propulsion, is just the net force, 300 newtons. I want to know her acceleration. I know acceleration is the net force divided by the mass. So you will just take 300 newtons to solve this in your review packet. Divide it by 200 kilograms, and the answers are down here. For the second table, we've made it a little more difficult. Um, this time, I have a constant 60 Newton resistance. I know that acceleration is still equal to the net force divided by the mass, but this time, I have this 60 Newtons of resistant force. So I have to take the force of propulsion and minus that resistive force. You might want to draw a free body diagram. So here, I have zero Newton's net force, so I'm going to get no acceleration there. In the second little bit, I have 360 Newtons of propulsive force minus that 60 Newtons of uh, resistive force, so I get 300 Newtons net force, divide that by the mass. That's where your answer is going to come from. In the last bit, I'm solving for a force. I know that force is equal to mass times acceleration. Her mass is 200 kilograms. Her acceleration is 4 meters per second every second. So I need 800 newtons of net force. I know that I have 60 newtons of resistive force. So my force of propulsion, therefore, has to be 860 newtons. Okay. All right, let's look at this one for a second. I have a two-block system here. One of these blocks is on the table, block A. One of the blocks is hanging off, block B. Um, it says that block A is on a horizontal, friction-free table. It's being accelerated by a force from a string attached to block B. So the string you can see is pulling it this way. Block B is falling. Block B falls vertically drags A horizontally. Block A has a mass of 2 kilograms. Block B has a mass of 2.5 kilograms. What is the mass of the system? Well, that's hopefully fairly easy. We just have 2 plus 2.5. 2 
4.5 kilograms for the mass of the system. All right, B says, what is the force that accelerates the system? It's gravity acting on B. That is what is causing this to move. That is the thing that is accelerating the system. But I can talk more intelligently about it than just saying gravity acting on B. It's pretty intelligent, but I know more about it than that. I know that B alone has a mass of 2.5 kilograms. I know the constant acceleration due to gravity is 10 meters per second every second. So I have mass times acceleration. I get this force. I get 25 newtons of force. That is what is accelerating the system. Further, if I wanted to know the acceleration of the entire system, this is not falling as quickly because it's dragging this. This is not um, moving as quickly as it would as it if it were in free fall, right? So hopefully we can see that. So acceleration would be the force, 25 newtons of force is accelerating this system divided by the mass, and I will leave you to solve that on your own. All right, looking at this one, you can look at the notes that are posted with this. Um, just look for number nine, force vector diagrams. Uh, look for this, and you can do this. And I want you to do this, and I want you to go through and draw these force vector diagrams on your own paper. I did want to talk about one thing for just a second, though, the parallelogram rule. That was an important part of this course. This is how we added vectors. So I have these blue lines here are the ropes that are holding a mass up. This little red dot is representing the mass. So this is like a free body diagram. So I'm showing you I have a force going off this way holding this thing up. I have a force going off this way holding this thing up. And I'm showing you this is mass times gravity. This is the weight acting on it in the downward direction, this arrow I've got here. So that's weight. And then I have drawn this little uh, purple one is the exact same length. So I know that the resultant of this force going off this way and this force going up that way will be this right this force going this way this tension force plus this tension force we'll call this one t1 and this one t2 we'll add together t1 plus t2 we'll add together to equal this purple arrow the resultant which is in the exact opposite direction of the weight downward okay so the resultant is going to be right there i can use the parallelogram rule then to figure out the magnitudes i already know the direction of t1 is going off this way I already know the direction of T2 is going this way, right along the blue line. The tension is going to be right in the rope there, okay? So now, now that I have the resultant put in there, I can uh, construct that parallelogram that would add to that. This would be the diagonal of the parallelogram. So uh, let's do that with a... Can we do that with a line? Yeah, let's do that with a line. So I'm going to start like here and go to there. And I'm going to start here and go, it looks like, making opposite sides parallel as well as I can. There we go. And now I can see, well, let's not use red again. Let's use green. I went up this far. So that much tension force. This is telling me about the magnitudes. I already knew the direction. And you can see if you measured, that one would be a little longer. And actually, maybe that should be a little, I think it's not quite parallel. That looks a little better. A little better. OK. For this one, I again want to encourage you to um, maybe get out some graph paper to do this yourself. Look at your notes. Look at the force table lab. If you have that in your notebook, um, look at your notes if you're looking through your other reviews at the same time. Also look at the notes that are posted along with this uh, review packet. So I have 
300 grams at 45 degrees and I have um, 400 grams at 135 degrees. Notice that the distance between them, if we're talking about degrees, is still 90 degrees. There's 90 degrees in between them, meaning these forces are acting at a 90 degree angle, meaning I can use the Pythagorean theorem to solve for the resultant force. Okay, so I have 300 grams acting at 90 degrees to um, 400 grams. So when you use the Pythagorean theorem to solve this, for the resultant, uh, it's going to be a 500 gram resultant. Um, so try this. Complete the parallelogram. The resultant will be 500 grams. You will be able to draw it if you make a scale drawing, if you have access to a ruler and you do that, and, and a protractor because you want to make sure they're at 90 degrees. Um, then the direction, you can use your protractor to read. I don't expect you to have a protractor when you take this final, so, so don't worry too much about that. Um, and, and you would be able to show your work using the Pythagorean theorem. Why can you use the Pythagorean theorem? Because these forces are at 90 degrees to each other. There's 90 degrees in between um, these two. All right, here we are looking at work. I want to determine how much work is done in these scenarios. I have a 400 kilogram load and it's being raised 12 meters above the ground. I know that work is equal to force times distance. Of course, force is a vector. Work is equal to force times distance, meaning work is also a vector quantity. Um, I'm not just going to take 400 kilograms and multiply it by 12 meters because 400 kilograms is not force, it's mass. So for force, I need its weight. And that's an N, not a W. It just got a little messy there. So let's try to make this a little better for you. I took that 400 and I multiplied it by 10. 10 meters per second every second is the constant acceleration due to being in Earth's gravitational field where we all are right now. Um, so I get 4,000 newtons. So 4,000 newtons is a force times 12 meters gives me 48,000 newton meter joule. That can also be written as 48 kilojoules because kilojoule is 1,000 joules. Uh, 5 newton friction force stops a book that slides 20 meters across tabletop. Well, 5 newtons doesn't matter how much mass the book has. I have a force and a distance, 5 newtons times 0.2 meters, 1 joule. It's negative because this work was done to stop the motion. It brought it to a stop, didn't set it into motion. So the direction of the force was against the direction of motion. All right, here we're talking about work again. We're talking about a uh, machine doing work. Uh, for this, we're going to use work in is equal to work out. You know that work is force times distance. So force in, distance in equals force out, distance out. So these are all our quantities. I have them over here. And we're going to go right into the problem to get them. So force in. In the hydraulic system, it's observed when the small piston is pushed down 10 centimeters, large piston is raised uh, 6.25 millimeters. Car weighing 10 kilonewtons is to be lifted by the force. What force must be applied to the small piston? So force in is what we don't know. Um, force out. It told us that this car weighs 10 kilonewtons or 10,000 newtons. Um, this, we have to know everything else. Distance in. That's how far. This is the small piston. This is the large piston. Distance in is how far down we push this small piston. It says 10 centimeters. Well, that's 0.1 meter. I'm going to make sure all our units are the same. Large piston is raised 6.25 millimeters. So I know that that is equal to 0 0.00625 meters. So now I have everything. I can set it up. Force in times distance in is equal to force out, distance out. When I use my algebra to solve, I get 
the force you need in is 625 newtons. All right, here we have a snapshot of a wave. So we're going to look at this and start to try to answer the questions. When we read the problem, I find out something important about this wave. I find out that it is vibrating at 520 hertz. So I already know one thing about it. That unit of hertz describes the frequency. So I know that its frequency is 520 hertz. And remember, hertz pretty much means per second. Um, so I want to know the wavelength. I'm going to look at the graph to find the wavelength. It's important that I read this little thing here. It's talking about units. It tells me the distance is in meters here. Um, and the y-axis, the distance is in centimeters. So this is meters. This is marked in centimeters. So I want to know the wavelength. So I'm going to go from crest to crest. I go from 2 to 6. So that's 4 meters. 4 meters for the wavelength. Uh, amplitude. I am looking at the maximum distance. This wave goes away from this midline here. So I can either measure down or I can measure up. Either way, I will get 0.1 centimeters. Remember this is measured in centimeters. Period. I need to know that the period is the inverse of the frequency. 1 over the frequency. So it's 1 over 520. I can use my calculator to solve um, for that. I'll get this. T, uppercase T is standing for period. And then I want to know the wave speed. So for that I have to know that the speed of the wave, the velocity, is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. I've solved for the wavelength, or I've used the graph to read the wavelength. I know the frequency is 520, so I can solve and I can get the speed of this wave. All right, here we go. We solved the problem, not unlike this before. Um, I'm told vibrations from a 512 hertz electronically driven tuning fork have set up standing waves in a string clamped at both ends. I know nodes at both ends. Uh, the wave speed for the string is 125 meters per second. I know that will be important later. And it has five loops. Uh, each of these loops has an amplitude of 2.5 millimeters. So that's going to be important in my sketch. I could label that. This distance from here to here, 2.5 millimeters. I know about the amplitude. I have these nodes. In these antinodes, it told me five loops. One, two, three, four, five. Five loops. Um, what is the wavelength? Well, I know that the wavelength through that wave equation I can solve if I know the velocity and the frequency. Here I'm told it has a speed of 125 meters per second. 512 cycles per second. Per second cancels out, leaves me this unit of meters. When I round, I'll get 0.24. I want to know what is the length of the string. Well, it's two and a half wavelengths long, so I'll take my wavelength, I'll multiply it by two and a half, and I'll get 0.6. Uh, depending on how you round it, you might get 0.61, but uh, that's how to do that. Geologist problem. Geologists learn about the structure of Earth by timing sound pulses, which is a form of a seismic wave, sent into the Earth. It is found that the explosion at the Earth's surface, I've made a little explosion here, um, returns to the explosion site after 6.25 seconds. So that wave goes down and comes back up. What I want to know is how far below the Earth's surface is the layer that reflected this wave generated by the explosion. I can assume that the speed of the pulse is 5,600 meters per second. Sketch, we've done that. Here's the explosion going down, coming back up. If the total time is 6.25, I'm going to take that, divide by 2, I get 3.125. So the distance is equal to the rate that it was traveling, 5,600 meters per second times 3.125 seconds. That's how long it took it to get down there. And I get 17,500 meters. Uh, when you see this one, don't worry about it. We talked about this a little bit when we talked about sound. Um, we didn't get it, the chance to do this in the lab this semester. So I don't want you to worry too much about this problem. If you want to see how we solve this, um, you could look back at the um, lecture for chapter 20. 
um, it had to do with sound. I think we went over this a little bit at the end. But don't worry about this one. Here, when we talked about shock waves, you um, use diagrams like this to answer questions about how fast an aircraft was traveling relative to the speed of sound. So you need a measuring device to do that, or you need the, these measurements to be labeled. Um, where I saw confusion was it does not matter what the scale is. It doesn't matter what the unit is. It doesn't matter what the scale is. It doesn't matter what the unit is. I can use inches to measure this. As long as I use inches to measure this and this, or I can use centimeters, I can use whatever. It doesn't matter because it's the ratio that's important. I'm talking about how fast this plane moved in relation to sound. So I'm telling you, at some instant in time, the plane was right here. Now it's here. It's at the tip of the cone. Um, the, the disturbance that it sent out in the air molecules, the sound wave went this far. It went from where the plane was, where that disturbance started, to the edge of the cone. The plane went this far. It went from where it was to where it is now. It's at the tip of the cone. So it was right here. It started a disturbance. That's the sound wave. The sound wave went to here, to the edge of the cone. The plane went to here, to the tip of the cone. This cone represents the instant that this plane is at the tip. If, if I had said, well, what about when the plane was here? Well, that's fine. This would be shorter and this would be shorter. The ratio would be the same. So this cone represents the instant that the plane is right here. So the plane has gone from where it was to the tip of this cone, and the sound wave that it made went from where it was to the edge of this cone. It's all those intersections of those sound waves that are making up this shock cone. Um, so to figure out, this is aircraft A, this cone. How fast is it going? Measure this. It does not matter what unit you use to measure this. All that matters is the ratio. So if I tell you this is two inches and this is one inch, this plane is traveling two times the speed of sound. Um, if you were to measure these, if you printed out that review packet and you measured these, this plane is going at 1.8 times the speed of sound. You can measure the half angle. If you have a protractor, it'll be 36 degrees. Um, I'm not asking you to have a protractor, so don't worry about that. But this is the half angle, and I think most of you got that. It's this right here, the top of the cone to the path of the plane. That's the half angle. Aircraft B, do the same thing. The distance the plane traveled, it's going to be distance plane, whatever scale you use. It doesn't matter. You're just coming up with just a number. The important thing about units here Oh, I wish I hadn't decided to write this. The important thing about units here is just that they're the same. So distance plane, and we're just going to use D to mean distance for sound, divided by distance sound, and you'll get a number. If you get 4, it's moving at 4 times the speed of sound. If you get 5, it's moving at Mach 5, 5 times the speed of sound. Um, when you measure these, if you could print this out and measure. This line here is three times longer than this line. So this plane represented by this cone is going at three times the speed of sound. You can measure that half angle. It's narrower because it's moving faster. So it's a 20 degree half angle. Coulomb's law, you should know. I left um, a few out. I left some out because, or I leave some out after this because we just reviewed these with the electricity and the parallel plates and all that. If you want to see these, you can look at um, the last um, Zoom session recording that we had, and you will see me talking about um, the parallel plates with the electric field, flying through a strong electric field, an ice crystal, all that. Okay, so. They are important, but we just did them. All right. Uh, I'm going to use Coulomb's law here. I know that Coulomb's law describes a force. The force is equal to Coulomb's constant multiplied by the charge on one body times the charge on the second body because Coulomb's law describes the force between two charged particles. So it's Coulomb's constant 
charge on the first particle, that's what Q1 is, times charge on the second particle, that's what Q2 is, and then all of that is divided by the square of the distance between them. So I just go into my problem here to get the, the numbers. I know Coulomb's constant is equal to 9 times 10 to the 9 Newton meters squared divided by Coulomb squared. Um, I have two pellets. They have a charge of 6 microcoulombs. They both have the same charge. So Coulomb's constant times 6 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs is Q1. Q2 is the same. They have the same charge. 6 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. I'm going to divide all that by the distance between them squared. I'm told that the distance between them is 5 centimeters. I put that into meters because of the units of Coulomb's constant. I want it to come out in newtons. And when I solve this, when I put all this into my calculator, I will get 130 newtons. If the force um, would be stronger if they were only separated by 2 centimeters, instead of everything is the same, Coulomb's constant is the same, the first particle is the same, the second particle is the same, but now they're only separated by 2 centimeters, which is 0.02 meters. Put that in my calculate, calculator, and I get 810 newtons of force between them. When I look at this guy, we're talking about electric potential. I want to know what is the voltage change when an electric field does 12 joules of work on a 1 microcoulomb charge. See that funny little U with the tail? We know that that letter is mu. Look at your metric conversion sheet and you're like, oh, that's 10 to the negative 6. So I know that voltage is equal to joules divided by coulombs. So I have 12 joules. So 12 joules divided by 1 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. And I will get 1.2 times 10 to the 7 volts. What if that same electric field did 24 joules of work, so twice as much work, on two microcoulombs of charge? Twice as much work on twice as much charge, you're going to get the same result, 1.2 times 10 to the 7 volts. For the rest of the problems in this packet, you can look at, um, like I said, the last Zoom session because they all have to do with um, circuits, we're figuring out power or something to do with electricity and we just reviewed problems that are very similar to that. So if um, you're solving all these problems, which you should be, look at the last Zoom session to see um, problems like those solved.